Please join me in the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter number two, and we're going to restart at verse number one in just one moment. Let me remind you that I believe this is being written down by King Hezekiah after he'd gone through a life crisis because he would begged God for more time and God gave him 15 more years of life, which was a great thing until you get to thinking about it and then realize, I've only got 15 more years. And so year after year, he would have kind of updated himself on that. I've only got 14 years left. I've only got 13 years. Now I've only got a dozen years left. And over time, he began to wish he could figure out the meaning of life and how to make the most of it. And that's a very frustrating sort of thing to have to come to the conclusion of, that life really only has value in how it's lived. And so he eventually comes to the conclusion at the end of the book, which you should always have in the back of your mind when you're looking at this book, that once everything is said and done, here's the thing that becomes clear. We must fear God, that is, respect God, and do what he says, keep his commandments, because everyone's going to give an account to God at the end of this life with what they did in this life. But as we look through this book, Hezekiah is going to be open and honest with how frustrated he got in trying to make the most of life, make sense out of life. And so he experimented with different things and hoped that this would give meaning to it. And so in chapter number two, he tells us of one of the things that he engaged in in order to enjoy life to the full. Verse one of chapter two, I said in my heart, that is the place where you think, Come now, I will test you with pleasure. Enjoy yourself. So he figured maybe if you just allow yourself to enjoy everything around you, that that will let you make sense of life. Maybe control the passage of time. But he says in the last part of that verse, but behold, this also was vanity. That is, it's out of control. It's not something that you can save and shape uh, by your own will. Verse 2, I said of laughter, it's just mad. So if you try to make everything just happy, 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 eventually you have to come to the conclusion, well, it's not always happy. That's craziness to try to approach that life that way. And of pleasure, what use is it? So if you're just constantly trying to please yourself physically with all the stuff around you, does that change the fact that you're going to die? No, it doesn't. And this is what he says. He says, I searched with my heart how to cheer my body with wine, my heart still guiding me with wisdom, and how to lay hold on folly till I might uh, see uh, what is good for the children of man to do under heaven during the few days of their life. So he, he says, one of the things that I did was I became a wine connoisseur. I tried to just enjoy the produce of my vineyards. And we know people that do this. Uh, Their whole life seems to be focused on uh, attaining a new vintage with a different color and smell and taste uh, that's brought on by where and when those uh, vines produced and were bottled up. Uh, Now, he uses his wisdom, so he's not getting drunk all the time. Uh, You're misunderstanding uh, his point, if that's what you think he's doing here. Uh, And it wasn't just becoming connoisseur of wine. He tried to do 
everything similar in life to that same concept. Because what's the point of the wine connoisseurs? They're wanting to just enjoy what's been produced by the vines and bottled up. Well, there's a lot of other things that you can do uh, in life that will bring a similar bit of enjoyment. Look at these that he also does. Verse 4, I made great works. I built houses. And some people do exactly that. They'll build houses with open floor plans or or minimalist floor plans or multiple stories or uh, scenic overlooks or this thing and that thing. And they do it because they just want to have a beautiful experience in the house. So that's what he tried. And I planted vineyards for myself. So he didn't just simply depend on other people raising and bottling wine that he could then experience. He decided to become a vintner himself and grow his own grapes. But it wasn't just that. Here, here's what else he did. Verse 5. I made myself gardens and parks and planted them with all kinds of fruit trees. This is another thing that people do in order to try to enjoy life. They make gardens. Uh, sometimes it's a small little cottage garden. Sometimes it's a, a vegetable garden or a flower garden or maybe a combination of those two. Or it might be uh, some sort of, uh, of tree plantation. Maybe they like to walk amongst the, the woods that are mostly poplar or maybe birch, or maybe they like the fruit trees. He mentions fruit trees here. Maybe a whole orchard of apples or pears or cherries or oranges or lemons or whatever else. And you just make it where you could walk through it and you can taste the fruit or smell the smells. I mean, um, when I'm recording this, uh, it's before Christmas. And so my wife and I, uh, went out the other day and cut our own Christmas tree to bring in for our own enjoyment during this season of the celebration of Jesus coming to the world. And I love the smell of evergreens. I grew up with the smell of cedars. That was our Christmas tree choice. Uh, now we prefer white pines when we go and cut. And so you love just going out and smelling the smells of the outdoor. That's what he's talking about here, folks. He says, I made myself places where I could do all of that, just walk and enjoy the sensations of life. Verse 6, I made myself pools from which to water the forest of growing trees. So if you're going to have gardens and parks, you almost always have to have water to keep those things growing, but it also makes an extra feature. Who doesn't like to hear the sound of bubbling water? Here at our house, we have several ornamental pools, and we try to have fountains in those pools that'll make bubbling sounds. Uh, some people like to make little streams in their property so they can hear the sound of the water going over the pebbles or over the rocks or maybe a waterfall. Well, he talks about all that sort of stuff. He, he made it pragmatically to water his plants, but also that would be a place that he could enjoy those sounds as well. Verse number seven, I bought male and female slaves. The word bought can also be acquire, as in hired. And the word slave here can simply mean an employee. It could just simply be someone that was uh, putting their work out for service, uh, for a price. Uh, remember, the Jewish people had a system that, Slavery was always temporary, and it was always because of indebtedness. And so most of the time, uh, you could have maybe a couple of slaves that were paying off debts that would be in your service. But if you wanted a bunch of them, you're going to actually have to pay people that were not in debt. And so here he has a whole bunch of servants doing all the things of life because uh it was a matter of convenience that you didn't want to do all the different things to keep your houses and your fields and your parks and your water features and all of that. 
you couldn't do that personally. You had to hire somebody to do all that. He also said, I had slaves who were born in my house, meaning he's got multiple generations of people working for him. You know, the kids of current servants grow up to become the next generation of servants. So people that he's known their entire life. He says, I also had great possessions of herds and flocks, more than any who had been before me in Jerusalem. Herds and flocks are needed for providing food and the material for clothing. And uh, if you've got a whole bunch of people working for you and you've got a kingdom to run and a palace that's open to all sorts of foreigners coming in to do business with you. You've got to have lots and lots of animals to do all that sort of stuff. He says, I had more than anyone before me. Verse 8, I also gathered for myself silver and gold and the treasure of kings and provinces. So he talks about being exceptionally wealthy in precious metals and probably jewels as well because that was just part of being king to have all that stuff brought into your treasury and think about yourself being rich enough that you'd never worry about being poor i got singers both men and women so music for us is most often reproduced electronically right uh, but back in this time, before that sort of technology was common, you wanted to have live music. So that's what he does. He has on standby, ready to go, musicians and singers, both men and women, performing for him at a moment's notice his favorite songs, and they're probably coming up with new songs all the time. So he's got them ready to go because sometimes that makes you feel better. Because remember, that's what he's looking for here. He's trying to figure out how can I enjoy my life and kind of put off this, this sense of dread that is out there and the fact that I've only got so much time left. And he was definitely on a time uh, table uh, as he'd been told he only had 15 more years. Now, the last line that I told you I was going to come back to today because I disagree with the typical English translation. And before you think I'm full of myself, so does the Greek translators of the Septuagint. Uh, they went with a totally different meaning than what I'm about to read to you from the English. It says here, many concubines, the delight of the children of man. And a lot of people have said, oh, that's because this is written by Solomon, and Solomon, you know, had uh, 700 wives and 300 concubines because he was just sex crazed. Well, that was not the point of concubines. Uh, most wives and concubines were, uh, especially by kings, were attached to business and uh, uh, state uh, arrangements between countries. The Hebrew is a little bit hard to sort out. But the Greek Old Testament, the Septuagint, which is a translation from the 3rd century B.C. Uh, by those who knew both the Hebrew and the Greek languages of that time period, they used two words. One is masculine, plural, and the next one is feminine, plural, but it's based on the exact same root word in Greek. And it's the word for land. Uh, excuse me, uh, that's the Hebrew. It's the word for land. And then the, the Greek uses same idea, uh, a masculine plural and then a feminine plural uh, based on a root word that has to do with wine. And so it, the Greek Old Testament has the idea of these are wine servants, or wine workers, the people that were trying to produce the different vintages this guy was interested in. While the Old Testament uh, is using the word for fields, which again is agricultural workers. 
So I would suggest to you, this has got nothing to do with concubines. It's got everything to do with the larger context we've already been looking at, and that is Hezekiah, the writer of this book, in my estimation, was talking about how he tried to get the land to bring him pleasure and joy and to bring all that stuff into his life so that he could smile about it and forget about the ultimate end of death. Verse number nine. So I became great and surpassed all who were before me in Jerusalem. And I remind you again that the Old Testament is very specific, saying that Hezekiah was the greatest of all the kings that were in Jerusalem before him. Uh, so I became great and surpassed all who were before me in Jerusalem because of all the things we saw in the previous section. Also, my wisdom remained with me. So he didn't just go crazy wild. His wisdom stayed intact. His choices were made based on what he knew from God. Verse 10, whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I kept my heart from no pleasure, for my heart found pleasure in all my toil, and this was my reward for all my toil. So that's, again, a reference back to the previous section that we just went over in detail. All that work that he commissioned and organized, that brought him joy. And it was his reward for investing all of that thought and effort into trying to bring happiness to his heart. And then came the test. Because remember, he was doing this for a purpose. To forget about the ultimate end. Verse 11. Then I considered all that my hands had done and the toil that I had expended in doing it. And behold... All was vanity and a striving after wind, and there was nothing to be gained under the sun. So he didn't get any extra days out of that. It didn't stop the fact that his death was still approaching. It was trying to grab wind and stuff it into a box, shape it, and save it for later. You can't do that with life. Life has to be lived as it happens. That is the big lesson to be learned from this book, folks. Verse number 12. So, I learned to consider wisdom and madness and folly. So again, he, he's talking about those different ways of approaching life. Wisdom, thinking about it from God's perspective. Madness has got a sense of a, of a puzzle that has to be unraveled. And folly is just, just being silly, just being crazy about stuff. For what can the man do who comes after the king? Only what has already been done. So remember, this goes back to something he'd said earlier. Life is just repeated generation after generation after generation. There's nothing new. It's the same sorts of things that just keep happening over and over again. So here is Hezekiah living his life out, and he says, now, what's going to happen after I'm gone? What's the next king or the king after that going to be able to do? Verse 13, then I saw that there was, uh, that there is more gain in wisdom than in folly, as there is more gain in light than in darkness. Now, this, don't miss this. This is one of his lessons, is that I did learn this. It's better to be wise than to be silly about it, than to just let things go crazy. Because you see, there's, there is some gain in, in doing things the way God would want you to do it. That would be walking in the light as he is in the light. You don't want to go stumbling around in the darkness. Verse 14, the wise person has his eyes in his head but the fool walks in darkness. Now, most fools walk in moral darkness of their own free will choice. They could be walking in the light, but they'd prefer to do things their own way. You remember the thing I repeat over and over again. David wrote, a fool has said in his heart, there is no God. 
That's his way of saying, I'm in charge of me. No one gets to tell me what to do. And that's the sort of person that's going to walk in darkness. So Hezekiah, who I believe is the writer of this, says, a wise person's got his eyes in his head. He's going to be walking in the light because he's trying to follow God's wisdom. The fool who rejects God's authority, he's going to be walking in moral darkness. And yet, listen to this, I perceive that the same event happens to all of them. So even if you're wise and walk in God's light, you're going to die physically, unless you happen to be one of the few that's alive when Jesus comes back in the air. The ultimate fate for everyone, whether they are foolish or wise, is physical death. That's because we are all descendants of Adam and Eve, who because of sin brought death into this world, physical death. That's just the way it works. Verse 15, Then I said in my heart, what happens to the fool will happen to me also. Now, that can be a little depressing, right? Why then have I been so very wise? And this is one of those places where you get the sense that it frustrated him. And I said in my heart that this also is vanity. For of the wise, as of the fool, there is no enduring remembrance, seeing that in all the days to come will all all have been for long forgotten. How the wise dies just like the fool. So he gets frustrated, as I think all of us will, if we overanalyze this. No matter what I do, even if I do good things for God, and Hezekiah had done a lot of good things for God, no matter what I do, I'm still going to die. The unwise person is going to do all sorts of wicked, sinful things, and they're going to die. But so am I, no matter what I do. And so this is is his testimony as to how he reacted to that uh, when he initially uh, came across that. Verse 17, So I hated life, because what is done under the sun was grievous to me, for all is vanity and a striving after wind. So... It frustrated him, it made him mad, it made him pouty that no matter what he did, even the good things didn't change the fact that he was going to die. Verse 18, I hated all my toil in which I toil under the sun, seeing that I must leave it to a man who will come after me, and who knows whether he will be wise or a fool. Yet, He will be master of all for which I toiled and used my wisdom under the sun. This also is vanity. So here I am. I'm doing my best, doing things for God, and yet I'm going to die. And everything that I've accumulated, all the blessings that I've drawn to myself through doing things God's way, all that's going to be turned over to somebody after me. Presumably, it'll be somebody I designate, But I don't know how they're going to use it. They could just waste it. But we have no control over that. And so that kind of frustrated him too. Verse number 20. So I turned about and gave my heart up to despair over all the toil of my labors under the sun. Because sometimes a person who has toiled with wisdom and knowledge and skill must leave everything to be enjoyed by someone who did not toil for it. This also is vanity and a great evil. (coughs) Excuse me. Now, he's not talking about a moral evil there. He's talking about something that makes you upset. That's just rotten. It's horrible. It's not fair. Uh, And this is why you'll sometimes see people with these bumper stickers. I, I always smile when I see it. I'm out spending my kid's inheritance. Well, that's where this guy would have been. Is like, why? Why should I save all this stuff up and hand it over to somebody? I don't know what they're going to do with it. They'll waste it, perhaps. That's not right. I don't like the idea. So I'm going to spend it all before they even get their hands on it. Well, most parents don't stay with that idea. Uh, It's just a momentary 
frustration point. And that's what's going to happen with this guy too. Um, verse number 22, what has a man from all the toil and striving of heart with which he toils beneath the sun? For all his days are full of sorrow and his work is a vexation. It's hard work to work. Uh, and you have your good days and then you have your really bad days. And those bad days are the ones, unfortunately, we often remember. Even in the night, his heart does not rest. This also is vanity. Sometimes we can't leave work at work. It follows us home and it robs us of our sleep. That's what he's saying. And there's really only one thing that we ought to do to that. And that is we need to adjust our attitude. Listen to what his advice is here. There is nothing better for a man than that he should eat and drink and find enjoyment in his toil. This also I saw is from the hand of God. For apart from him, who can eat or who can have enjoyment? For to the one who pleases him, God has given wisdom and knowledge and joy. But to the sinner, he's given the business of gathering and collecting only to give to the one who pleases God. This also is vanity and a striving after wind. Now, a couple of things here. The second one first. It was understood proverbially that for some wicked people that cheated and did things wrongly, God would intervene and take their stuff away from them, particularly in a society where judgment was carried out from God's standard. That stuff would be taken away from them and given to somebody that would use it properly. But for the majority of people, you just have to make the most of a life as it happens. You need to enjoy it day by day. So don't wait until retirement to enjoy your life. Take those holiday moments now and enjoy them with your kids and your grandkids and your wife and your husband and your friends and family because you don't know what tomorrow may bring.